Okay, so sorry that that didn't work. That's um, Jennifer Bria. She was doing a TED Talk. She was a Harvard PhD student um, who developed myalgic encephalomyelitis. And so she starred in a movie called Unrest. And that's a very good documentary, if you ever have a chance to watch it, that gives a very good idea of what it's like to live with this illness. So as we're going to get started, um, even we had the dental students before us, so, uh, we'll, so just keep filing in as I'm talking. I want to welcome you. Um, thank you for coming to the Student Interest Group in Neurology Lunch Lecture on Myalgic Encephalomyelitis. It really means a lot, not only to me, but also to the patient community in this area that you're here today. Um, this is a disease that's not taught in the medical curriculum, and so it's a big deal to them to know that students are starting to learn about it. And it's also very meaningful to me. Um, this is my dad, and he went to medical school here. He trained to be a surgeon. Um, when I was three months old, he was operating one day, and he felt like he had the flu. So he went home from his surgery, and the next day he tried to go back to work, but he was having a lot of orthostatic intolerance, so he wasn't able to sit up or stand upright. And he never was able to go to work after that. Um, he's still homebound, and um, so I dedicate this lecture to him. This is a picture of us polka dancing together, um, which, since he's homebound, it's very difficult for him to get out. So we just celebrate the good moments that we can share together. So before I start, a few things. You all have folders, and in the folder is some information that you can look at throughout the lecture and afterward. And there's also a survey, and we want you to fill out the survey at the end. Um, especially we have a question on there, would you support this becoming part of the curriculum? It'd be great if you can um, either write or tear that tab so that we can see if we will add this to part of the curriculum, especially the neurology curriculum. That will really help patients. Um, there's a significant impact that can be made for patients if we have awareness of this disease. So some disclosure, I will be talking about medications that are off-label uses. There are no FDA-approved treatments for this disease, so we use treatments that are approved for other things. Now, also, this uh, presentation is made possible by, by funding from the SOLVE MECFS initiative, which is a national organization, and the professional student government here at the U. To illustrate what ME can look like, I'm going to use the case of one of our guests here today, Jeff. Say it, wave your hand, Jeff. Yeah, there you go. Um, and so this is his case when he first presented. It's 2011, and Jeff comes in. He's 17 years old, and he's in the pediatric neurology clinic. His chief complaint is he's been having arm tremors, leg weakness, his eyelids have been fluttering, and he has jaw quivering. Three weeks before this, he had flu-like symptoms with a headache and nausea, no fever. He stopped swim club, and he started missing school because of fatigue. His legs buckled in gym class, so he presented to the ER twice. Both times, he was given IV saline. Previously, Jeff was a healthy high school senior in excellent physical condition. He is training for an upcoming swim season, for which he was going to be captain. He is 6'7 and 194 pounds, so good BMI. His uh, social history, he has a strong circle of friends, a steady girlfriend, and he's an optimist, excited about college and the future. So in the pediatric neurology clinic, the neurological exam is normal. To test for neuromuscular disorders, an EMG and nerve conduction study are done. Those are both normal. A little bit later, he turns 18, so he goes to adult neurology. They think possibly he has a viral syndrome of some kind, their MRI and MRA was normal. They did a CK, creatinine kinase, that was normal. Um, SED rate and B12 were normal. And anti-nuclear antibody was also negative. That would test for lupus and a lot of other conditions. He goes to family practice. They test for Lyme disease and mononucleosis. Both of those tests were negative. At this point, Jeff has been asked by a lot of physicians uh, whether he's stressed or not. So he has actually asked for a psychological evaluation to make sure nothing was wrong with him. The evaluation came back normal, and the psychologist said, I couldn't make something up if I tried, and even noted that he's more optimistic than she would have expected for his situation. 
One month later, he's now primarily homebound. He has to complete his senior year online, and he can't participate in the swim season that he was training for. He lost 20 pounds also due to abdominal pain. He also presents to the urgent care at one point for shortness of breath when climbing stairs. His cardiopulmonary exercise test was normal. However, there is no previous comparison um, to his peak physical condition as an athlete. And also the test itself exacerbated his symptoms in the following days and it required recovery just from doing the test. So for further evaluation, he goes to a, an unnamed clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, there, the internal medicine, medicine physician says, I'm mystified after just reading his history and all blood work comes back normal. He sees a gastroenterologist and they find grade B esophagitis, delayed gastric emptying and give him Prilosec. The neurologist defers doing a lumbar puncture or repeat tests because it's unlikely to find more information. He rests about six months and his symptoms actually completely disappear. He starts attending college full time and is working two jobs. However, with that extra added workload, his symptoms come back in the fall. He has leg weakness, headache and flu-like symptoms and he has to go back to online school. For three years, he's symptomatic but able to function. He stops pursuing medical evaluation because there really haven't been any answers found. However, he does go to a neuromuscular clinic in 2015. There he's diagnosed with ME-CFS, which we'll get back to later. In 2016, he has a downturn in the symptoms. He's homebound for one year and even bedbound for a few months, during which he was lo losing his speech he was too tired to eat or even read, his legs were giving out, and he was having tremors. More recently, he tried a food elimination diet. Within 24 hours, he was feeling better, evidenced by being able to shovel the driveway. His function improved 30 to 60 percent. He still has good days and bad days. Currently, he has headaches, weakness, achiness, sore throat, and cognitive dysfunction. He's still not able to read or go to work uh, go to school or have a normal social life. He's been trying to apply for disability for the past two years. So overall, this is a athletic gentleman who presented um, with neurological symptoms after a flu-like syndrome. And his overall workup was negative, yet he had um, significant debility and a course that was fluctuating over time. So Jeff was diagnosed with MECFS. And I want to talk a little bit about that name. It's a little confusing. Um, so ME stands for myalgic encephalomyelitis. So it means muscle aches and brain and spinal cord inflammation. That was used by the World Health Organization when it was first classified as a neurological disease. And that's the term that's used worldwide. Chronic fatigue syndrome was used by the CDC in 1988 after some outbreaks in Incline Village, Nevada. But the patient community prefers not to use this name due to stigma. As you can imagine, some patients are told, well, everyone has chronic fatigue, or why don't you just take more naps? So to get at a name that could better describe the scope of the disease, the Institute of Medicine in a report in 2015 tried to use the word, uh, proposed the term systemic exer exertion intolerance disease. However, this hasn't really caught on with the patient community. So for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to use ME or MECFS to refer to the disease. So if you want to look in your folders, there is a diagnosis and management page. And I'm going to go over the core symptoms that the Institute of Medicine decided to define MECFS in 2015. But I want you to know that there's a lot of different criteria out there, and this is just one of them. So the first core symptom is that there has to be a substantial reduction or impairment in the ability to engage in pre-illness levels of occupational, educational, social, or personal activities that persist for more than six months. So for Jeff, he had to go to school online. He wasn't able to swim anymore. He has limited social life, and he had to have accommodations with working. He's also accompanied by fatigue, which is often profound. For example, being homebound or bedbound, is new or of definite onset, so it's not something that's been there their whole life. It's not but the result of ongoing excessive exertion. For example, he stopped swimming. 
and it's not substantially alleviated by rest. For example, another summer, he rested the whole summer and did not get better. The second core symptom is post-exertional malaise. And that term means that there's, a there's an exacerbation of symptoms, but there's a delay in time. For example, when he had the cardiopulmonary stress test, that came back normal, but then the next few days, his symptoms got worse. Unrefreshing sleep is also core to this disease. No matter how much these patients sleep, it does not help their fatigue. And then patients need to have one of the next two neurological symptoms. They need to have either cognitive impairment, which can be brain fog, um, troubles with concentration or memory, and then orthostatic intolerance, so inability to tolerate standing upright or even sitting upright. And this could be due to hypotension, their blood pressure drops, could be postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, in which the heart rate also increases rapidly when they stand up. However, there's a lot of other common neurological conditions, and this is why we're presenting this through the student interest group in neurology. Um, these are reasons that they might present to a neurologist. The first is pain in the muscles or joints. It's often widespread, such as fibromyalgia. And this is a drawing that a patient did in one of the clinics I worked in, and it gives you an idea of the severity and the widespread nature of the pain. Patients can also have muscle weakness, poor coordination or ataxia, numbness and tingling, partial paralysis, and very common are headaches and migraines. But there are a lot of other common symptoms that patients can have, don't always have, that bring them to many, many other medical specialists, not just neurology or primary care. So the first is gastrointestinal dysfunction, such as Jeff had the esophagitis and delayed gastric emptying. IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is quite common. They can also have small intestine bacterial or overgrowth and celiac disease. And then some patients have very severe sensitivity to light, sound, touch, taste, or odor. For example, this patient who can hardly tolerate normal sunlight or normal sounds. A subgroup of patients have significant allergies or chemical or food intolerances. And then some patients have endocrine dysfunction, so cold or heat intolerance or hormonal deficiencies. And then quite common are immune sy symptoms, so flu-like symptoms, tender lymph nodes, sore throats, and fevers. There are a lot of other comorbid conditions listed here that patients can have. I'll talk about a few later. Um, but one that's not on there that I want to mention um, that can be fatal for these patients is suicide. And I mentioned that I have a, a friend who has this. Um, she is not clinically depressed, but she's asked me a number of times, tell me, why is the life that I'm living worth living? Um, she's not getting support from her physician, and she just has no hope. So thank you for being here, because this is something that you can save lives with. The onset of this disease it can be triggered in multiple different ways. So it seems to be that ME is a final common pathway. One is infection, like my dad had, typically viral. People will say, I had the flu, but it never seemed to go away. Some viruses that are known to trigger ME are human herpes viruses, parvovirus B19, and entero enteroviruses. Physical trauma or surgery can also be a trigger. For example, I saw a young patient who got it after getting hit in the head with a baseball bat. And then periods of intense physiological stress. So any severe illness, I saw someone get it after dengue fever. And then um, it could be environmental exposure or intense times of emotional stress. And in healthy people, it may require more than one hit, so more than one trigger in order to eventually develop ME. The prognosis is very variable and it's not predictable either. There are some people who spontaneously recover after a period of rest and never get it again. There are many others who it's chronic and it relapses depending on how much they do, but they're able to function. And then there are some who are, it's chronic and it's very severe and unrelenting. So the prevalence of this disease is very hard to determine because it's an estimated 84 to 91% of cases that are not diagnosed. So in the US, we say that there's about 800,000 at the lowest to 2.5 million, some even say 4 million at the most. So we say 
Well, there's probably over a million who have it in the US. Worldwide, probably 17 million. It's two to four more times more likely in women than in men. The age range is four to 77. I've heard of patients um, two years old, even six months old, who've had this. Uh, the peaks are around puberty and 30 years old. Most of the studies have been done with Caucasian patients, probably because they're most likely able to pursue medical treatment. But some studies suggest that actually it might be common, more common in minority groups. There's a lot of economic burden due to ME. And one fourth are, of patients are housebound or bedbound. Others are able to go to work, but they might crash every day after they go to work. So this is Jessica for an example. She is 22 years old. She lives in the UK. She's been bedbound with ME since she was 10 years old. So that can give you an idea of what this disease can be like. So the impacts of ME are huge, especially on quality of life. This is a study from Denmark comparing ME to a lot of other major medical illnesses. And ME was the lowest um, of a lot of very severe illnesses, such as colon cancer, stroke, diabetes, MS, chronic re renal failure, and depression. However, for all of that, and a disease that really desperately needs answers, the per patient research funding is much, much lower than other diseases. So thousands for HIV, hundreds for MS and Parkinson's, $9 per patient for ME. So with that, I want, I'll turn it over to Becky, and she's gonna talk about what it's like as a patient to have ME. Hi, um, can you hear me? All right, so uh, my name is Becky, like Nicole said, and this isn't working. It says it's on. Uh, and uh, I, I have ME. I am a biochemist. And my onset was actually gradual over a period of about two years. These were actually the first two years when I was doing my dream job of being a chemistry professor at Williams College. Um, I had to go on medical leave for about a year. I tried to get better. I went back to work, I completely crashed, and I haven't been able to even work a part-time job since. I spend about half of every day lying down so that I can leave my house a few times a week. Um, so I want to talk about what it's like to have a disease that has so much stigma and misinformation and lack of information in the medical community, and, and um, I won't focus on all of the implications in the world at large. Um, Diagnosis is one of the first problems that people with ME have. It's difficult to get diagnosed. Um, most doctors don't want to diagnose you with it. And um, average to five years for diagnosis. For those who do get diagnosed, Nicole mentioned already that some like 85 to 90 percent of people with ME will never get diagnosed. They might self-diagnose. Um, I got diagnosed, um, but uh, my doctor, actually the first one who diagnosed me, didn't, didn't write down in my chart that that's what I had, which later had implications for trying to get disability uh, benefits. If you're lucky to get diagnosed, you still probably won't get treated, because even though there are medications that do help, um, most people won't have access to them unless they go to one of the approximately 15 doctors in the country who treat this disease. So think about that for a moment. There are 1.5 million people with the disease in the US and 15 doctors. Um, actually, Jeff and um, Susan, and well, I don't know, Jeff also and I all go to California to see our doctors and then work remotely with them the rest of the time. Uh, so you can see that there's a huge need for clinical treatment of this disease. If you started a clinical practice looking at ME, I promise you, you would never have trouble finding patients. <laughs> um, so treatment is a difficulty. And then also, even if you're diagnosed, most doctors don't understand how to manage the disease, and they won't give useful information on how to, how to manage the disease. So many patients don't understand their own disease for years. For instance, if I had known that um, going back to work was going to make me worse, I wouldn't have tried to go back to wor work full time. I did have some accommodations, but they weren't enough, given that when I went back to work, I still couldn't stand for three hours at a time. 
Um, so managing disease is actually really key. That's one of the main things that people with ME have to do, and Nicole will talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, not having diagnosis, not having treatment leads to difficulties uh, with getting accommodations. So without a doctor who really supports you and understands what you need, it's going to be difficult for you to get the accommodations you need at work or at school. You think about pediatric patients. Um, and for them, it's even more difficult because as an adult, I had a history of being like a hardworking go-getter. You know, I got my PhD. I got a, a good tenure-track job. But if I were six years old or 10 years old and I didn't have that history, it would be easier to la label me as a malingerer. Um, also, accommodations in life. So many of us have um, handicap parking or handicap um, accessibility sort of uses that are helpful. Um, we may not use them all the time, but that when our symptoms are flaring, it's really helpful. Um, Getting medical leave and disability benefits, all of those things require that a doctor say that there's something wrong with you. And the first part of that is finding something wrong with you. So having the right medical tests. So they did all those tests on Jeff, and none of them were the right ones to find the things that are wrong with him, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, so, and then there's just general misinformation in the system that we would love to move out of the system, and the only way for that to happen is for education in medical communities to really ramp up dramatically. So I'm a scientist, and I didn't actually even believe in CFS or ME as a diagnosis. I'd never heard of ME. I didn't believe in CFS. I thought it was a wastebasket diagnosis. And I really didn't want to get diagnosed with it because I knew you couldn't treat it. And I just wanted to get better. Um, so what changed my mind, what brought me around, was learning um, about the science and what's known. And I feel like right now we're still learning different bits of the science, and we haven't put the whole picture together. But I will talk about the things we do know. I'm going to focus on these three areas. Um, but there's even a lot more. I'm just trying to, there's a research synopsis in your folders. It's a few years old now. I'm going to talk about some of the newer stuff as well. And if you're always welcome to come talk to me or send me an email. I love to t talk about it more. So the first thing that's really notable about people with ME is that we have notable immune dysfunction. And natural killer cell cytotoxicity is, is decreased considerably in people with ME, and that correlates directly with illness severity. So lower natural killer cells, you're going to feel worse. Um, my natural killer cells are about two. Normal is double or tri triple digits. Um, Another thing that's seen a lot is autoantibodies. So probably every patient has some autoantibodies, but which ones will vary, and that's what makes it unique from other um, autoimmune diseases. Although it's not surprising that the female to male ratio relates similarly to uh, autoimmune diseases that have been seen, other autoimmune diseases. One thing that I'll note is there are some that are directly related to the neurological system, so adrenergic receptors, acetylcholine receptors, serotonin, gangliosides, phosphatidylserine, these things are all really relevant to neurology. Uh, altered cytokine concentrations are seen basically any place that one looks. So I'm going to show you some data from one of those studies. This was done at Columbia, and they were looking at cytokines in cerebrospinal fluid. So they were looking for inflammation in the nervous system, and they were comparing people with ME in blue to people in, with MS in red to non-diseased controls in gray. And you'll see that the MS and the ME signatures for these cytokines are actually really similar. Uh, every once in a while, the ME will look even more altered than the MS. And every once in a while, the MS will look more altered than the ME. But uh, this is just a smattering of the whole, p of the, um, a much larger study that was done. I just couldn't fit it all on one page. Um, more, looking more directly using imaging, people have seen uh, neuroinflammation by looking for activated microglia. And so the activated microglia uh, were seen in specific regions of the brain as being increased in people with ME over here compared to people uh, who are healthy controls. So this is just uh, one example from the left thalamus that, was sh that they're showing 
the increase, and um, they could show that by mapping, um, statistically comparing one versus the other. So you see that there are a whole set of different specific regions that were affected uh, in ME patients. And what was interesting is some of those regions, the level of activation of microglia was also directly related to the patient's symptoms. So cognitive impairment directly related to activation of microglia in the amygdala. Pain was related to the thy thalamus. Um, so I just talked about these two. I'll just mention briefly that there are also seen higher ventricular lactate in cerebrospinal fluid. And recently, um, there's a lab in Alabama that's been doing some great uh, imaging studies. And they've shown that higher lactate activity or lactate levels in the same brain regions that were showing the activated microglia before. Um, we Nicole talked about post-exertional malaise and doing something and then crashing. I will experience that later. <laughs> um, but this, this study actually started to show more directly that this actually happens. They can measure it. Um, so what they, do, what they saw was that in these cardiopulmonary exercise tests, very often, just like Jeff, the first test looks normal. Some people don't. I don't look normal even on the first testing. But if you did a second test the next day, most people, including cardiac patients, would be able to reproduce their first day's result, even if that result was poor. Um, people with ME can't reduce, reproduce that next day's result. So almost every parameter, at least some patients, will decrease in, in their ability. The one thing that stays the same day to day is the level of, of um, effort that they put in. So they're able to control for that the people are still actually putting in the same level of effort both days. So it's been interesting to, since that study came out, to start to look at this uh, or to see how people are looking at the um, effects of exertion on people with ME and starting to exacerbate our symptoms before studying us. Um, and one thing that was seen was increased expression of a whole set, a whole bunch of different sets of genes. I'm showing you here the adrenergic function genes, including adrenergic receptors. And you'll see with normal people, healthy controls, they start out at um, normalized to one. There's a little bit of increase in gene expression after exercise, um, but, they, but it's pretty mild. And some things actually even go down. Um, people with ME start out at one and have this massive increase in gene expression after exercise. So there's definitely something happening with us that doesn't happen in most people. Um, there are a whole bunch of other studies that are showing similar things. They're looking at different, different parts of the system and wondering what gets perturbed. Uh, one other thing that I'll note is that cognitive ta task impairment gets worse after exertion, which isn't too surprising. Um, and if you do that study in a, well, they did this study in a, in a brain scanner, and they saw increased activities in specific regions of the brain in people with ME after exercise. So I'd love to talk about this. There's so much more to be said, but I hope I've given you a sense that there is a lot of scientific understanding behind what we're saying about the disease. And if you have any more questions, you can ask me. I just want to mention that there are a whole bunch of other um, sort of key things that one could think about and talk about, including um, really notable metabolic dysfunction in people with ME, endocrine dysfunction, and probably the H HPA axis will end up being at the center of a lot of what's going on with people with ME, although that hasn't been shown yet. Um, there's uh, dysbiosis in the microbiome and the gastrointestinal tract and um, circulatory system problems, including um, low blood volume. So. I'm going to hand it back to Nicole, and um, she'll tell you more. OK. So I'm going to talk about potential treatments. Um, and first, I'm a fourth year med student at the University of Minnesota. I'm not an expert. I did work with um, one expert in Salt Lake City, Dr. Bateman. I'm going to be working with another in Florida next month. But I just want you to know that what I'm saying um, is like it's probably likely to change, and it's, also, it's evolving, and it's not coming from someone who practices medicine yet. So 
Um, these potential treatments are treatments that some patients have found a lot of success with that seem to be aiming a little bit more at the mechanisms that Becky was just talking about. The first, antivirals, um, probably has been the most significant for the most patients. Also, if you're leaving, if you could leave your survey at the top, that'd be great. We don't want to miss that. Um, so antivirals, one of the most successful ones has been valgencyclovir. And there's other antivirals that are especially effective if people can find the viral profile that um, fits the correct antiviral, which is the research that's being done at Stanford. And then immunomodulation has been looked at, um, including IVIG. Um, monoclonal antibodies like rituximab um, has shown recovery in some patients, but only a subgroup of patients. And then immunomodulators are also being tested like cyclophosphamide. Nutritional supplements have helped majorly in some patients. So coenzyme Q10, uh, carnitine, and vitamins like B12 and vitamin D. Pyridostigmine, or mestinon, has helped some patients a lot. This is a, an um, acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, and it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. And it could help some patients by overriding sympathetic overactivation, or some patients might have antibodies, actually, to acetylcholine receptors, and this might help them for that reason. We're not really sure yet. And then low-dose naltrexone has helped some patients a lot with neuroinflammation. So again, a lot of these treatments, they're trial and error. It depends what patient you have in front of you. It depends, it's the discretion of the clinician. Um, I would recommend looking at research, talking to experts in order to um, play with these symptoms often. But there are some things that clinicians can do for every single patient, and that's pacing. And this is something that any patient can do. So this means avoiding energy debt by planning how much you're going to expend and how much time you're going to need to take to recover. Patients sometimes use heart rate monitoring. They use friends and family. Like my mom and I will sometimes tell dad, we know that you want to come, like, um, but you won't be able to, or we know that there's this other activity you want to do later in the week. We don't want you to be too tired. Um, then there's some therapies like graded exercise therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy that were more recommended when people thought this, this was a psychological disease. Um, but they have been shown not to be helpful for ME. In fact, they can be harmful. Um, graded exercise therapy can compound post-exertional malaise. And cognitive behavioral therapy, trying to um, not act in accordance with the symptoms you feel, can inhibit effective pacing because patients do need signals that they're overdoing it, or else they will have to pay later. But a lot of patients can still do some simple exercises to avoid deconditioning, not all of them, but most of them can do stretches, that really helps. And then there are some other comorbid conditions that if you can identify them and treat them, it can really significantly improve a patient's ability to function. For example, Jeff training the food elimination diet. So one of those is orthostatic intolerance, or POTS. You can do it just a 10 minute test to diagnose that, and that can be treated with fluids or salts, compression clothing, and various medications. Another are hormone deficiencies. So I've seen some patients in the clinic um, with Dr. Bateman get almost completely better with vasopressin that was replaced when it was deficient or growth hormone. And then as we talked about dietary or chemical intolerances. Mast cell activation syndrome is a syndrome of inappropriate mast cell activity. And patients who have this will have a lot of allergies, rashes with GI issues, they'll have flushing, chronic regional pain, and a number of other systemic symptoms. And starting antihistamines often can help these patients. Patients can have primary sleep issues like sleep apnea. If you treat that, that will help significantly. And then pain, staying on top of pain is always helpful. And treating mood disorders like secondary depression or anxiety is also very helpful to help patients function as best they can. So now I'm going to turn it over to Le Leanne. She's going to talk a little bit about support and resources. Can everybody hear me? Is that okay? Thank you guys so much for coming and being here today. This is so important to find out about this illness. Um, I am Jeff's mom. I'm going to get teary just talking about this because medicine failed him. 
There was nothing. You're normal. Every test is normal. It just means the test isn't invented yet. And brilliant minds are working on this and trying to figure it out. And I will tell you from what you heard today from Nicole and Becky is more than most physicians in the Twin Cities know about this illness. Let that sink in a little bit. It's an important lecture to have been to today. And I hope, and well, I know that you will see this patient population and you will be able to say, I believe you. I know this is real. Let me find out more. Let me remember. Let me go back and figure out how to help you. We don't want you to be out there unprepared when this population walks into your office and you meet them. Again, as a, as a mom, as an occupational therapist, is what my career was, I understood enough medicine to know that my son was not faking it. When he tremors like this, there's something wrong. He needs more than a bag of saline. But there isn't anything yet that has really helped it. We're almost seven years down the road. He lives at home. His life hasn't been realized and may never be. We have had conversations about suicide. It's that real. He has hope because the scientists are trying. He has hope. So that's how we go through every day, that we know that there's something coming. Um, in this process, I have just continued to reach out and look for people and found other people like Lisa Eliotto is she and I have partnered together with Suzanne Wheeler and Dan Curry and created the Minnesota MECFS Alliance. We're a nonprofit organization and our goal is to be a wonderful state organization so that no one has to be alone when they're given this diagnosis. That there's something, our biggest question that we get is, do you know a doctor? And we say, we don't. We, I don't know anyone yet. I know some ideas. I know some things that might help. At this point, people are left for, with Facebook medicine, is what I call it. And it's very sad, but it's, there's brilliant people out there that are helping, each, helping people figure out what they need right now. Um, we have a, we talked about the folders and the surveys. It's really important that you pull these surveys out and you tear yes or no so that we can um, get some feedback from you about this lecture. We have uh, time for a panel, a few people here. We hope you have questions for us. We've got Nicole, um, Jeff is available to take questions, Lisa, myself, and Becky too. If you guys wanna have a seat up here, if you can. Um, and if you ask me your question, I will repeat it for the recording and we will get you an answer. It's okay. Easy questions, hard questions. Yes? How did your friends and family react when you found out? Jeff, how do your friends and family? Well, family. <laughs> lucky for me, family was incredibly supportive. Uh, even for the many years where they didn't know what was going on, they were believing me and supporting me and doing everything they could. I've had nothing uh, but some support from friends and when I finally got the diagnosis, they're like, well, at least you have a name for it. So that's a plus. <laughs> My family was really supportive. I've had friends who have had trouble relating um, and there is tension sometimes with people who don't really understand. Like, I look really normal when I'm out, but that's because I'm only out when I'm really normal. <laughs> supportive as well. Um, I'm an attorney um, and I've always been very type A personality. I've climbed mountains in the past and all kinds of things. Um, the mountain climbing obviously has stopped and I'm, I do still work but I work with accommodations to work from home because things as simple as taking a shower and sometimes even picking my meal as far as how much I'm going to chew um, has affected my day to day but thankfully my family's been very supportive and they no, I think given that I, I got it just a couple of years ago, they kind of had this history of me being very active in my life. They know I'm not just being lazy or anything like that. But I think people who get it younger 
may not have that history established and sometimes there isn't that family support that's there for them. And from an employer perspective, um, when Becky talked about the stigma, having it be called chronic fatigue syndrome, I've experienced that at work where they just tell me, well, you're just tired, just go to work, I'm tired too. Um, and they don't understand what that really means. So having it called the ME is, to me, a really big deal because chronic fatigue syndrome is such a misnomer for the, feel, the symptoms that I have are so far beyond just fatigue. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Did you have any pre-symptoms before getting this disease? I um, actually had a bout of really deep fatigue about two years before I started getting really sick. Um, and I rested a lot and got better. And I think like Jeff had this sort of a similar story of like, I had this like deep aching fatigue. I rested during the summer and then I got better. And then it sort of would come back periodically. And then at some point I just couldn't overcome it anymore. So for me, that was the main pre-symptom. As far as me, the pre-symptom was just sort of like a general flu. I just thought, oh, I'm kind of sick. I'll go to school, whatever. And it wasn't until I tried to stand up from the lunch table and my legs started buckling. And even then, my friends were like, you should go to the nurse's office. I'm like, I'm fine. And I struggled up the stairs. And when I could barely make it up the stairs, I'm like, okay, this isn't normal. So it was very innocuous, and then it just kept building. For me, it seemed gradual onset, but to be honest, I have a lot of memory loss, so I, I do, it's possible that the, something happened a couple years ago that I have forgotten about that may have been a triggering event, whether it was a stressful event or something like that in my life. So for me, it was a little bit more gradual, nothing I can pinpoint it to. How does, the, how does the disease affect your sleep? Yeah. Um, my sleep was not great before <laughs> I got ill. I, so I probably had sleep apnea for a long time, which is I actually think what was the cause of my uh, initial bouts of fatigue. Um, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea uh, about a year after I started getting really sick with um, when I was um, on medical leave, and the CPAP did really help me a lot. So that that is a component of it, um, but it's definitely not the whole thing. Like I had hoped it would be when I when I had this sort of like miraculous improvement. Um, I also I've had insomnia for a really long time, so it's hard to know. I feel like my sleep hasn't changed that much. It's just that when I wake up, I still have symptoms, um, so I need to rest more. So for me, my sleep had been pretty horrible uh, all throughout high school. And then after that, I was just sort of, you know, I'll sleep when I am tired. And when I finally got into the habit of establishing a sleep schedule as like a desperate, maybe this will do something, it actually did improve my symptoms. Uh, and that was what allowed me to feel well enough to, you know, go back to college for two years until I, you know, continued to get worse slowly, but, you know, improved sleep helped, but it's not everything. And as far as sleep now, I'm able to get a generally regular sleep. It usually takes me about an hour to fall asleep, but once I do, I'm able to sleep well enough. Um, to give you an example, so last night I slept for 10 hours, but it's very much, um, I have what they call like spontaneous arousals where I'm continually waking up and it's disrupting my sleep pattern, so I'm not staying in like a deep sleep mode. Um, and after sleeping 10 hours, and also prior to that laying on the couch since maybe five o'clock the previous evening, for the first hour of my day today, I felt pretty good, but that's all, s I'm back to being exhausted at this point. Um, and I, I know just going to sleep again is, I'm, I'm tired, but I'm, or I'm sleepy, but I'm not able to sleep. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, just not, a I can rest and lay on the couch, but I can't fall asleep. And even if I did, I know I'd wake up and I'd feel the same way or sometimes even worse. 
I will say just um, anecdotally, like sleep disorder. Well, it's not anecdotal. I think there's it's a fair amount of evidence that sleep disorders um, or sleep disturbance is either caused by, like it can be caused by or a cause of ME, both. Um, so it's hard to chicken and egg that over there. I've never heard of that. The light sensitivity is certainly an issue, and some people have extreme light sensitivity. Um, I spent a lot of two days ago in bed where even just the light from the stereo system was too bright for me. So I like had a pillow over my head. <laughs> um, so, but I've never heard of loss of vision. Um, so last December, I experienced a, um, quite a bit of vision loss, and I went to the doctor um, and they said that you do have a loss of vision, we can correct as much as we can, but at this point they said it was at the neurological level, so if it got worse they were going to send me to a neurologist um, specifically for my vision to see what was going on with that. One thing I do notice is that, so typically um, when I wear my contacts, I have the contacts that one is nearsighted, one is farsighted, and that worked fine for me for years, but ever since the vision loss problem started, it seems like my brain can't figure it out like it used to and, and let me see both near and far all the time. I can now only see far with my contacts, even though they're bifocal contact lenses. So I'm not sure the signs of that, um, but it definitely has affected my vision. Yeah. I just know my dad has night vision loss. Um, that's gone for him often, but no other vision loss. I think I would just um, want to interrupt here. We're at our time. We're a little over. We're gonna, we have the room for um, until 1.30, and we're happy to continue to take questions. But we understand if people need to leave, that is fine. Thank you again for coming. Keep your folder. We've got a business card in there with information about how to get a hold of us. We'd love to talk to anybody that would like more information. So are there any other questions? In the Up in the, in the back in the blue. We got a couple. Yeah, question. Yes. So yeah, those asking, are great asking questions. about the seve severity. severity. The so there's a huge severity range. Um, I'm happy to just take this for people. Um, all the way from somebody like Lisa who can work a job, and I know somebody who actually goes to physical work every day but then crashes all weekend. Um, and then there are people who, like, um, there was a picture of Jessica or Whitney who are completely stuck in bed, in the dark, um, headphones on, can't be touched, um, and really, like, totally, totally bedbound. So that that whole range of everything in between. Um, in terms of tracking apps, um, I use one. I don't remember what it's. I think it's called like Manage My Fatigue or something. I could show it to you afterwards. I think it's called Manage My Fatigue. Um, there's a there's a new research center being developed um, that's developing an app at um, Columbia University. So that'll be coming out in the next. I don't know, five years or something, but um, in the meantime, there are a few other apps. My dad's part of a study where they're using a ring that goes on your finger called the Aura Ring, and that tracks sleep and blood pressure and all sorts of cool things. So, yeah, and Fitbits. So. Okay. Um, you had a question? Positive interactions with doctors, what are some tips? That, that actually made me feel a little teary, <laughs> just the question. Yeah, no, it's um, a, any doctor that has an understanding, like any understanding of the disease or is willing to learn about it, is that's like a godsend. I had to go to a rheumatologist because I um, tested positive for Sjogren's early antibodies and we wanted to know if there was more to that. And I was just like, so I'm... And I hear this from every single person with ME. Like, if you have to go to a new doctor and they're not an ME specialist, like, there's this, like, fear that they're going to 
that they're going to, you know, be dismissive or whatever. Uh, the first primary care doctor I tried to see here told me three times in 15 minutes that it was a controversial diagnosis. And I knew I did not need to see her again. <laughs> and I was just looking for a primary care doctor who would work with my California specialist. Um, so really anybody who has knowledge or is willing to learn. That's for me. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, as far as positive, m I was incredibly lucky that the you know childhood doctor that had been seen, when I brought this up, he believed me and has been working with you know, doctors in California to help make sure I'm able to get the medication that I need. And if I'm like, hey, I need to get a disability parking, he's like, certainly, you know, explain to me what you're feeling, what do you need, how can I help? And it's just been, it's meant the world. Personally, I found most of my medical appointments to be extremely stressful and they usually trigger quite a bit of a flare up because I feel like I have to go into the appointment armed with medical knowledge that does not come natural to me because I'm a lawyer, I'm not, I don't know anything about medicine, so I'm kind of speaking a language I don't know. Um, but I feel the pressure that I need to advocate for myself um, in a way I'm not fully equipped to advocate for myself. The best thing a doctor has ever said to me is just, I'm over my head in this, you have to see someone else. Um, which isn't helpful, but at least she admitted that she was over her head with it and knew that I had to go somewhere else for help rather than to continue and this was after a year of trial and error of medications with her, but at least she, we got to a point where she told me, it's time, like, you have to move on to someone else because I can't do anything more for you. I would say the one other thing that's been really helpful in terms of doctors is um, I've, I've had to go on medical leave. I had a doctor who actually, she first started to treat me, and then... Um, she couldn't find anything wrong with me, so there was nothing wrong with me, and she wouldn't support my continued leave, even though I wasn't any better. Um, so doctors being able to like write letters and say, this is what's wrong with this person, you should do X, like she needs disability, she needs that. It took me two years and $50,000 in legal fees to fight to get long-term disability from my employer insurance, um, and I'm still waiting for social security disability. So it's a long process and if I hadn't had resources and family support, I don't know, I'd be on the street, like literally. And I know of stories like that and they're very scary and sad. So doctors who are willing to like write letters and, and like really show up and support, that's huge in the blue over there. Was it ever yeah. diagnosed as undetected Lyme disease was the question. Yeah. Um, I've been tested twice, and I've had doctors say, like, well, you're sort of on the cusp, and you have some, but not all the antibodies, and maybe. Um, so there's some question about that, but I have been tested for it, um, maybe, at some point. It's always like, okay, which, thi which medication do you try first? Like, what thing do you try to address first? So you don't want to change everything all at once. Um, so I also had the viral, all the viral titers. I had like all these other things. So it's like, okay, well, what do we treat first? <laughs> yeah, definitely a lot of testing for Lyme, but you know, it's sort of a similar case where it's, you know, some of the antibodies are there, but we're not sure to proceed, but rather than go with, you know, undetected, they just sort of went, well, let's try other things and we'll loop back to Lyme if we run out of things to do. I was tested a lot for Lyme, but everything came up negative, so that was never really pursued for me. Yeah, after seeing a lot of patients, it seems that there are some patients who get this after Lyme disease, um, but it's only one of many triggers, just like EBV could be, or parvovirus, or getting hit in the head with a baseball bat, so it's just, yeah, so there are some people who get it after Lyme, but not everyone. Did you have a question early on? You had your hand up.
Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah. Yes, there's, I'm sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but like there's been a lot of work done to try to find a biomarker. This is an active form, field of research. Um, clinicians in the meantime use what they can. Um, and certainly there's a lot of research to find a single consistent biomarker or a set of biomarkers that will be consistent for a, you know, a majority of patients. Um, it seems pretty clear that there are probably subsets of patients. For instance, those a, um, adrenergic and acetylcholine receptors, only about 40% of patients show um, positive autoantibodies for either one of those. So 40% of us would look bad, but the other 40, you know, 60% wouldn't. And so then the question is finding whether there are a set or, you know, a single thing that is actually consistent across all people who have ME. That is definitely an issue. There are clinicians who are doing work together and there is also there are regular research symposiums in fact some that you can watch online there was one by the open medicine foundation at stanford um just a few like a month ago and you can watch the whole thing all two days online for free um and then also the nih will be holding a research conference there will be a clinicians panel there um, it's free for anybody who wants to go, April 4th and 5th. You're welcome to come. It will be at the NIH on their campus, um, and I'm actually involved in um, helping um, choose speakers and, and plan that. So um, that's, that's going to be a really exciting symposium, but there are also regular symposia from different ME CFS groups across the world. So, um, Nicole? No. Yeah, and there there is a group in particular that has um, identified a likely panel that should be helpful. Um, I think that we're still working on trying to replicate that data, but it includes some cytokines like IL-1. Um, I think CRP was actually even on there. Um, so probably most likely a cytokine panel, maybe some suggestions for things to test like natural killer cell function, antibodies to test, things like that, I think will probably end up being on a profile. Um, maybe one more question. And I just, I just want to just double check any of the students. Another question. Good. Okay. I would say I was emotionally in the best place I'd ever been when I got sick. So I felt like I had a great store of ability to have equanimity around what was going on for me, um, which was, you know, sort of new in the previous maybe five years. Of I started meditating. I, I was like, I just felt like I was in a great place. Um, and I, I hear that a lot from a lot of people. So I'd say um, depression is... 
I, I, I had a bout of clinical depression when I was in high school, and I, I know what that feels like, and it's a vastly different experience. Um, that was just my... Uh, as far as my personal experience uh, with feelings of depression, when I first got this, I was in a similar state of best time of my life. I'm a senior in high school taking slacker classes surrounded by friends. This is the best time of my life. I'm having a ball. Uh, <laughs> But, and I mean, even now, I've always been very mentally healthy. I'm very optimistic. Uh, but there was a point when I just kept getting worse and worse after I had to drop out of college, where I was just like, if this just keeps getting worse, and the research could be years away, you know, maybe I just end this. This just feels pointless. What am I doing with my life if all I'm doing is, you know, struggling to get up and eat and then just lie around for the rest of the day. But that was never tied to my symptoms. Uh, that was always sort of just you know, a result of the symptoms, not in the reverse order. Um, so depression really has never been a problem for me. I always, for me, I feel like I have an ambitious mind and an exhausted body. I have all these things I want to do, but I, I can't do them physically, so I have to pick and choose. and. I will say I'm the worst person at pacing, which is something I absolutely need to get better at because I pay for it almost every day. Um, but I still find like ways to be happy and find you know, gratitude and joy and, and things that I can do in my life. But I do, all of that said, very much miss my hardcore workouts. I you know, wanted to climb Machu Picchu after climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, and I know that's a foregone conclusion at this point. Um, but I've just tried to substitute some of the things that I e want to do for some new things. And it's been fun learning a lot of new things. But that's not to say I don't miss some of the things that I really love doing as well, too. Yeah, and in general, um, among neurological illnesses, it's not uncommon to have depression, um, not only secondary to like losing your lifestyle, but uh, the, the, it's a pretty similar biochemical pathway. Um, so it can be difficult to tease out, but one good question to ask yourself is like, am I losing interest in things that I like to do and I'm able to do? Or do I not enjoy those things because I'm just not able to do them and it reminds me how little I can do? Um, so kind of teasing out where is the feelings come from? And do you, are you feeling uh, like guiltiness, hopelessness, like things um, like it might be hopeless because of your situation, but do you feel that in other areas of your life too? So kind of there's, there are ways to tease it out. Um, and so it, we've seen, and then people who have ME can have depression um, just as often as people in the general population. So we've, in the clinics that I've seen, it is something that we do have to like try to tease out, so. Well, your medical experience, did that come up often with doctors? Hmm? Of, of, of mental health? Yeah, mental health comes up often. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that is one of the problems. Um, I've seen people really, like, that has been their primary barrier to getting health care, is that their physician believes that it is mental health, um, and they feel like if they affirm the symptoms, they're affirming the mental illness, and so they will refuse to do more testing, um, and so it has caused a major problem for that patient to get um, significant help, um, and they usually just have to try to find a new clinician um, when that happens. Um, so we need physicians who are aware of mental health, but also willing to acknowledge that there could be either two things going on, or it could be a primarily physiological disease. All right, I think we need to kind of wrap up here. Um, thank you all so much for coming and hearing what we had to say, and please take it with you.